Yo, what's up? Dr. Swole here, MD, pro physique athlete, back with another episode on Swole Radio. Today, I'm joined by Jim Wendler, who is the founder of 531 and has a wealth of knowledge from the perspective of building strength and hypertrophy. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So we'll be going through beginner, intermediate and advanced training for the athlete who wants to build both of these qualities and talking about the differences in training at these different levels. So I think just starting off with the beginner stage, this is going to yes. be really helpful for a lot of people. And especially since Jim has a lot of experience training, you know, beginner athletes with the kids he coaches nowadays. And I think that it'll be a great one to start off with. So maybe Jim just talking about some of the basics in terms of getting started from maybe some of the, the foundational variables like volume, intensity, frequency, and that kind of stuff. All right, man, this is uh it's such a kind of a loaded question because there's so many factors that come into play here. Hmm. Um, just so everyone's clear, my wife and I work at the high school. So we work primarily with athletes, uh, particularly the football team. Hmm. Uh, so my wife handles all the seventh and eighth graders and then <clears throat> they graduate into my training. So they do have some, uh, the goal was to have a, a pipeline, so to speak in our hmm. community. Now, so, but the, <clears throat> we still have a wide variety of athletes. We have the physical absolute freaks. We have the skinny kids that are super tall. We got the short kids that, you know, four eleven. Uh, we have incredibly obese kids, obviously, just like everywhere else in this planet. Um, but the, regardless of your talent level on the field, the kids who make the best and easiest progress have a massive foundation of just physical preparedness. Mm. And I think that's, uh, so even if we, uh, you're not built to squat or, you know, or your parents aren't but you know, just giant behemoths, um, the kids that have been playing sports and have uh, maintained a healthy body fat percentage are infinitely easier to coach and work with. Mm -hmm. And so not only, uh, are they able to do the movements properly, but they're able to handle a little more work properly. As an example, uh, some we have kids uh, who are so overweight that they can't run a lap around the field. Uh, and so uh, they lack the mobility to even squat properly, uh, can't do pushups and stuff like that. So, and like I said prior, they lack the, uh, just the, uh, preparedness to do a full workout. So in the beginning, I think it's super important to have that kind of base. Um, I used to say that young kids, uh, as long as they play sports and are active, um, will have that, but I don't think that's any true because the version of activity today is varied greatly than it was 30 years ago. Mm. Um, so, but anyway, the, the point being is that they have that uh, just general physical ability. Let's say they, uh, I don't know, played baseball and they wrestled and they played football, you know, throughout junior high or something like that. By the time to get to me, they've already done a lot of the basic movements and have done agility work and running stuff like that. So, but what we always do with my, my youngest son's 11. And, uh, what we do is we start with just, uh, we, teach them the basics on uh, the barbell movements, the squat, mm -hmm. bench, deadlift, press, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And we never, ever, ever, ever load them heavy. I'd rather see them do multiple sets uh, of five or eight or something like that mm -hmm. with something that might do 20 or 30 with because they just lack the experience when bar goes haywire. Um, so we just do that. And then with our assistance work, that's where we kind of push things. Uh, because there's less, less of a loading parameter. There's less uh, um, chance of getting hurt. Um, so, and it's ironically that this is kind of what we use with some of our advanced athletes too. We do not load the barbell too much. And then we really, this is what Louis Simmons did at Westside. Mm, okay. So what's crazy is that the, some of those same parameters exist for the 11 year old kid I'm training in my weight room and the guy who's benching 500 pounds you know mm -hmm. the difference of course is the weight that they're handling and stuff like that so um the 
So we kind of have, we want to teach basic motor skills such as jumping. I, we jump every single day we're in the weight room. Um, we do calisthenics. Uh, again, we're not, doing, we're not like Navy SEALs out in the grinder doing 6,000 jumping jacks and burpees, but we use that as part, as part of a warm up. So they have different, uh, they, they have possessed different skills, great for mobility. Um, and it just, just physical work. Okay. Um, and we run, we run, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, high school football or football, but we run year round. Most teams don't do that. We just don't run a lot. And I think that's the key to any beginner training or even advanced training really is <clears throat> we don't, I don't concern myself so much with volume. So hold on with me here. Mm. We concern ourselves with doing things consistently over a long period of time. And when you do that, you can get away with doing a little bit less every single day. Um, and then we're never, ever burnt out. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so as an example, our off season training started the week after our season ended. And I want to say uh, it was end of November. So we had our first deload where we needed to take a little bit of a break uh, this Monday. Mm. So we trained that long, that hard for, I don't know how many, you can do the math on the month. So December, January, February, March. Uh, so let's say four and a half, five months mm -hmm. without needed to really back off because we just do things consistently and we do good things consistently. Okay. And I think people get so crazy about, uh, doing a million sets of this, a million sets of that. And it's, it's like the New Year's Eve res resolutions. Those guys want to train six days a week. Yeah. Okay. So bear with me. I say, how about you, you commit to twice or two or three times a week? Cause I know you can sustain that for five years, mm. but you can't sustain six days a week uh, for very long, especially as someone who's uh, just going on motivation. Right. Cause that, that only lasts until you get really sore and then you don't <laughs> want to get up in the morning. So the point is, is we probably do less than people realize mm. with our high school kids, but we just do things so consistently that it we're building our building with tiny little bricks every day. As an example, we probably do uh, now our in our, our lifts in the weight room, like real what you call strength lifts. We probably do three or four a day. That's it. We do one main lift a day, mm. and then we do two to three assistance exercises. And you say, well, oh my God, I do. I can do eight or my football team used to do this. Well, we do that for six years for these kids, mm -hmm. All right? Six years. Can you imagine if you put six, like, just, just say you, let's say you're not competing, but you're just trying to be average, you know, just an ass kicker. Right. And if you can put together a uh, little over half of a decade of training three days a week, kicking ass at three movements, your, <clears throat> your results were going to be a, just amazing. Just amazing. The problem is everyone wants to, cram everything in and then they can't figure out why their elbows sore you know why they stall on the bench press stuff like that so um the number two thing that we do with our kids is we never look just like my 11 year old we never load them too heavy hmm. and we were <clears throat> i would rather err on the side of too light and every rep is, is what we call sorry about my language but i get so fucking pumped up about this Oh, yeah. I, I'm always on my kids. I want every rep, every rep, you have to own it and you have to control it. Every single rep. I don't want to see this bullshit. I don't want to see bar speed slowing down. So every rep is an owned rep. So it's up, smash, you know, boop, just like that. Mm. And that goes for squat, bench, deadlift, press, you know, our big barbell movements. So we do a lot of really, really, really good, fast ownership reps. And I always say, you have to own the barbell. The barbell can't, can't own you. As an example, you see guys squatting and they go down and they're trying to reach parallel, but they're scared to death because if they go that much lower, you know, everything comes tumbling down. Yeah. I never want that to happen. I want ownership of every rep. So we don't, uh, and the kids get upset. So hold on. Like in the beginning, like I can do more. I'm like, I don't give a shit. You know, first of all, your 150 pound bench press is not doing anything for me right now. You you're not going to impress me. Like, <laughs> but I know you can do 125 perfectly all day. So let's just pound this shit out of that. And what ends up happening, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, 
uh, what is today? Th so Wednesday, yesterday, we mm -hmm. bench pressed and I had two of our older guys, one's a sophomore, one's a junior. They worked up on the bench press. Now, most of their, uh, we use a, what's called a training max. Okay. So we base everything on percentages. It's just very easy for me to hand out the papers. Uh, <clears throat> one of the kids training max was 185 pounds. So for the past, he's bumped up at five pounds every, I think six weeks. So he probably started at like 170 years, but I can't remember, but it's not very heavy. Mm -hmm. Yesterday he did six singles at 225 every minute on the minute. So six for six minutes, he did a single at 225. He's been training at basically with a 185 training max. That means most of his weights have been between 150 and 175. All right. Now think about that. I got that kid to smoke 225 for six singles in six minutes using those kind of weights because every rep, this kid's a fucking, just one of those kids that would run through a wall. You tell him what to do. He's not like, oh, I can do more. Mm -hmm. Every rep was perfect. And we built up that assistance work. We built up his upper back and chin ups and stuff. And he's never burnt out. Now he's not going to be able to do that all the time. No one does, right? You're never going to uh, reach that peak all the time, but that shows just how crazy if you do those lifts correctly and load them a little under what your ego thinks you need to do, mm -hmm. uh, everything gets taken care of. And we're, and because of that, he's never burnt out. And I'm sure, you know, like, you know, usually let's just say you're squatting in three fifteen, three, you know, whatever around that area. And then some days, man, it's just grinding you down at no point. Do we ever load these kids where they can have a grind because the weight's so light that even if they feel a little poor, they can still own reps. Okay. Yeah. So let's like, what's, what, what's your best bench right now? Just give me an example. Yeah. Maybe doing sets of maybe like a set of five at 235. Okay. So let's just say you bench press 250. I know, you know, that even if you're having a bad day, you could smoke and own 185 all day long. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we stay in that area for a long time, just perfecting, 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 and perfecting. And you know, you could always do a rep better, right? You can always push faster. You can always uh, set up a little bit better. And so we always want to be in that area. And you can do that for a long time, right? I mean, week after week, you never have to really come down. So, so, and then, uh, so that's what our main thing is. We own the barbell and then we push the shit out of our assistants with, and that's where we kind of go to failure with our assistance. Uh, like you don't, nothing's going to happen if you go to failure on chin-ups. Like mm -hmm. uh, nothing's going to, you know, go crazy if you uh, fail at push-ups. And to be completely honest, uh, we have kids, uh, you know, when they get to me, sometimes they can't do a chin-up. And to me, if you're an athlete, you should be able to knock out pull-ups and chin-ups. Uh, so we emphasize stuff like that too. And when all that goes up, their main lifts go up because all their supporting muscles and even their bigger muscles get better. Um, and I'm a big believer in uh, it's great that if you bench press 9,000 pounds, but if you're a young kid, an athlete, like you should be able to do all these physically fit kick-ass things too. And I think that stuff adds up over a long period of time. It's not sexy. It's not going to make cool Instagram videos. Uh, but I always tell the kids that they can't pass like a, the bottom level of a special forces thing. You know, if you can't do 60 push-ups or something or 50 push-ups, that's unacceptable. You're an athlete. And do you want to line up next to a dude who can't do push-ups like on the football field? Hell no. You want your buddy to be awesome. You never want to let your buddy down. So uh, I get really fire, fired up. Not so, I don't about the their general physical preparedness more so than I get fired up about how much weight they're lifting because that shit will come if we get their bodies ready and, uh, and what so real quick too what always happens is generally there might be a little pushback when they're younger right mm. and then they crash and burn when I, i'm like all right you go do what you want let's see what happens then they crash and burn and then they let their ego go we uh load them properly and then they make great games so that's you know sometimes how it goes so yeah not every yeah. kid's like that but most you know if, if the kid gets fired up i let them make the mistakes 
And, yeah, I like uh, that perspective, you know, what you said about being patient. And I think a lot of people oh. want to rush their gains and make it all happen right away and, you know, put heavy weights on the bar. But, you know, what you said about really owning each rep and making it really good quality, starting out with less than what you think you can do and just running that over time. I think people want to jump on these six day programs when they're just starting out. I'm like, you're going to get great gains as a beginner training three or four days a week and not even doing yeah. that much volume. Well, the other thing is what I found out is when we, the slower uh, our progress that we plan, the quicker you're going to get stronger. And I know it doesn't make any sense. And I talk to the kids all the time about this. I'm like, I don't even know how all this shit works anymore because we're, <clears throat> you might be a 500 pound deadlifter. We got a couple of kids who are in the 550 range. Most of their sets are 345, you know, three, 300, 350, somewhere, whatever. Uh, occasionally around the 365 the point being is they're continually just kicking ass kicking ass and then all of a sudden they did i know we had a kid who most of his sets were around 365 405 and he trap barred i think 585 for six reps like how is this possible it doesn't make any sense to me and i don't understand like it's so uh but so i think in the long term it's going to help you but i think even in the short term it's going to help you i really do and again, I don't know, have all the answers for that. I just know that in my own training, this is where I effed up a whole bunch. Mm. And whenever I backed off and just was patient, the results came much more quick too. So, mm -hmm. And then what happens when an athlete begins, starts transitioning into that intermediate phase? Like what changes in their training? Well, there's a couple things that happen is one, a lot of people quit because mm. uh, it gets really difficult. Because now you have to start learning and trying to figure out uh, maybe some new exercises or, uh, you know, different set rep schemes, stuff like that. Mm. So I think the, that's when you start both learning, experimenting, and failing horribly. I mean, you fail a lot. And, uh, and then you have some success, too. And the, the problem is, is everyone wants to go back to the beginner well. Like, well, when I was first coming up, my bench went from 150 to 250 and I did this. Well, it's not going to work again. Yeah. And I, so this is when, like I said, some guys will just keep on going back to that old school, old school, what they did prior. And they're just never going to make any more progress or you're going to have to look beyond everything and really start seeing, uh, you know, experimenting with sometimes ridiculous exercises, experimenting with how many days a week you train and a lot of this stuff too honestly comes down to uh how fast twitch slow twitch you are hmm. i know guys who are incredibly fast twitch and they just can't do that much you know they're uh they might do two or three things in the weight room maybe a total of eight to ten hard sets and that's all they can do um but the and then you have some slow twitch guys who are training way too heavy when they need to train a little lighter for higher reps and exploit what they have. So I think, you know, this is when you start finding out a little bit of who you are. And uh, it's, it's <laughs> the, the differences between these two groups, fast twitch and slow twitch is really crazy. And everyone thinks they're fast twitch, you know, until you see a guy, we had a kid uh, who's probably the fastest, most explosive person I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and that's saying something. And I remember watching him do a box jump. It was like a 66 inch box jump, which just measure that out sometime. And I shit you not, he jumped and it was like gravity turned off. He just wouldn't stop, you know, wouldn't stop just moving. And uh, I watched him and I watched him run sprints that were just never seen anything like this in my life. And uh, you, how he trained was vastly different than how someone like me just kind of a bullheaded grinder would would train mm. uh, or even a you know less uh you know kind of a even more average guy than me which is pretty amazing if there's a more average guy than me but anyway um and i think that comes into play too and i the problem is is uh you have to be honest with yourself and a lot of times for the fast twitch guys they have to really uh put their ego aside and not always train balls crazy million sets like they have to have the discipline to walk away mm. and uh 
that's very difficult too. So that's when you, and then the other thing too is with the intermediate is you have to understand there's going to be a long time between gains in main lifts. Hmm. You might, you're going to be stuck for a long time and that's okay. As one of my good friends once said, the longer I'm stuck, the bigger the payoff in the end. So you have to be willing to, and sometimes it doesn't matter how many changes you make. It does not matter. It's just, you're just going to completely just go in the, in the shitter. Hmm. And I think, a lot of times that's that's when you see who really loves to train and who's willing to to bear out the the hard times mm -hmm. and uh, that's it's a hard time especially uh you know when you have your favorite lift that always whatever you're talented at the bench squat and all of a sudden yeah. that hits the wall and you're like oh my that's the one thing i <laughs> i love more than anything and you let me down you son of a bitch so uh yeah and i i think a lot of times too especially with beginners and I hear this all the time that beginners should just stick with the bench, squat, deadlift, row. That's only going to take you so far. You're going to neglect a ton of the smaller, I say smaller muscles. But uh, And so what happens is by the time they reach, uh, they stall out or whatever they want to say, they don't have all that muscle mass and all the little things built up to help them push forward. So now they have to spend all that time uh, in the inner so-called intermediate phase, doing all the things that they thought were stupid, mm. you know, doing dips, doing curls, doing back raises, doing uh, hanging leg raises, um, doing glute ham raises, uh, tricep pushdowns, whatever, all these things, not all, but you understand what I'm saying, but they're so caught up in doing the basics or doing the, just the, the big meat movements. And I think that's wonderful to a point. And I, that's where, for example, instead of just doing those things, we're going to do uh, good barbell work, and then we're going to really build up that base. So now we can extend how long it is until you stall because we, we progress fairly low, light or fairly slow. Okay. I'm, I hope I'm making this clear. So we progress fairly slow. We extend the time it takes for you to stall out. But in the meantime, we're building up all the abs and low back and all the lat work and all the trap work. And now you have something to really uh, rely on when things start getting tough. So you need to extend that as much as possible. Everyone else wants to go up as quickly as possible. I want to extend it for as long as possible. And that's very hard to do. I couldn't do it. Now, if I had a asshole coach like me that was like, listen, you have no choice, then I think I could have gotten much stronger. Uh, maybe not in so you know in the weight room as far as like performance, but overall I would have been much stronger, much stronger. So yeah, yeah, does that, does that make sense? So everyone wants to do this with their you know peak out. I want to do this, and I want to extend it for six years, and then we just keep on building and building and building that base. So yeah, um, like you want to progress at a rate that is most sustainable. You know, like the fastest yes. rate that is sustainable. There you the go. Fastest rate. That's why say. you're a doctor. <laughs> I'm not. So if someone's coaching themselves, say like, say they're a gym athlete and how can they tell how fast, which they are in terms of their volume requirements? I think in the beginning, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, I don't say it doesn't matter, but it's, it's impossible to tell because you're not efficient enough at those lifts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think once you get fairly efficient, then that's when it really starts coming up. As an mm -hmm. example, uh, this is a crazy story. You, you know what the hammer throw is in the Olympics? Mm -hmm. uh, it's got the chain with the ball and they go, and then they yeah. spin around. They did some, uh, a, I don't know what he was, but he threw in the Olympics. So he's, you know, top 10 in the world. Okay. He, after he did his four throws in the Olympics, it took his central nervous system two weeks to recover. Mm. How many throws? Yeah. Four. So that is an extreme example. Um, but he only got there because uh, he didn't, when he was first starting out, he could do a million throws and be fine. But when you get more efficient and when you get your inter and intramuscular coordination really uh, locked in, that's when both good things happen and overtraining or just exhaustion can happen. I don't know if mm. you know, overtraining is the correct word, but the, the easy way of the easy way of doing it is taking like uh, 80 to 85% of your one rep max 
and seeing how many reps you can do mm. at that. This is like the real basic way of doing that. For example, mm -hmm. if you're a, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, 300 pound, let's say a 400 pound venture. And so what is that? 320, about 80%. Uh, if the more reps you can do there, the slower twitch you are. Mm. So if, if I, so for example, I've known guys who might be a 500 pound bencher, they might be able to get 455 for two. That's, you know, and then maybe 425 for three. That's all they got. Mm -hmm. It's really weird. It doesn't make any sense, right? And uh, where you'd expect them to get 12 or 15 or whatever it is. So the lower number of reps you get at a 80 to 85%, the more fast twitch you are. And uh, what <clears throat> I think it can be developed to a certain degree, because obviously you can develop your inter and intramuscular coordination. As an example, I remember I did a, uh, and I put it on video, I did a bench press of, uh, I don't know, maybe 455 or something. And if you saw it, you'd be like, dude, wow. Because the bar just went, rrr, rrr. and they're like, dude, you could have gotten five. I'm like, dude, I barely got that one. Mm. Like, that's that's all I, I know how my body is. When, and that's when I was powerlifting where everything was one rep max dictated. And I had developed that skill to a high degree. I didn't, I couldn't really grind through a lift on a squat bench or deadlift. It's either it's going right up or I'm just plummeting right down to the ground. Mm. And uh, I'm not saying I'm Mr. Fast Twitch at all. Uh, but that's my wife, on the other hand, her max uh, squat, for example, looks the same as her 20 rep set. Each mm. rep is like, Rrr! and I'm like, baby, you got <laughs> maybe one more. She's like, I got like 30 more. I'm fine. I'm like, How is this possible? <laughs> so, uh, you know, what's, here's a funny story. I'll, I'll never forget this. I know we're going off track here, but who gives a shit? Mm -hmm. uh, but my wife was pregnant. My wife is like fitness boss she's got a six pack and just trains her ass off and she's worked in the industry for like 30 years and stuff like that and uh so she was always she was never like into the strength stuff obviously like me i mean she still she did some powerlifting meets but you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. <clears throat> so she, when she got pregnant obviously her stomach got bigger right so i mean it was it's comical because she's a tiny woman mm -hmm. her squat skyrocketed skyrocketed when she was pregnant because her midsection got so thick and big <laughs> and she's like and she's like dude if she was repping shit just boom, bouncing out of the hole yeah. she's like all though. this time i thought you guys were just a bunch of fat asses uh, <laughs> and you know like you know muscle or fat doesn't do anything and she's like my squat it was the most amazing change she's she's like I, if i didn't experience it myself i wouldn't uh I couldn't believe it. So what's funny is even though when people say, well, fat doesn't move all that stuff, well, it gives you great leverage. Yeah. Uh, and even the guys that I trained with and saw compete that were what you would call shredded or anything like that, their midsections were stupid thick, like, like comically thick. <laughs> and it's like, he may only weigh 165, but his obliques and his abs were the same size of his giant lats, mm. you know? Uh, so they don't have that big D taper. So even and when people say, well, he's not fat, I'm like, he might not be fat, dude. But uh, those things look like, uh, you know, like he's got aliens coming out of his, his abs and obliques. So I don't know. I always think that's funny that like it took my wife getting pregnant to realize there was a reason why the super heavyweights in the Olympics uh, lift the most weight. Because <laughs> when those guys, if you're watched like Lasha, who is a uh, from the I think from Georgia, not the state from the country. My son couldn't believe that. There's this country called Georgia. What is this shit? <laughs> uh, it's crazy. But when you watch him clean and jerk, when he at the bottom of his front squat, man, he just catches and he goes, Boop, just stands right up because that big old stomach just throwing him up. So this yeah. is not me telling everyone to get fat, but uh, until you've been there and gotten big, like it's unbelievable when you get in that hole, when you squat, dude, it just goes, Boop, just... <laughs> You're so tight. It's awesome. Like you, the, unless you have like a million pounds, that bar is going up somehow. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Right. And I like the reverse of that is I'll warn my, you know, bodybuilder people that when you're losing weight, when you're getting shredded, oh, yeah. you're, it's a double whammy, right? So you can expect your numbers to go down and that's normal. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then uh, not, you don't have the same uh, water and fat in your joints. Things start getting a little creaky. Yeah. So it's funny because when we, when I was at Westside Barbell, we trained our abs and low back uh as hard as we did anything else i mean it was crazy we spent 30 minutes doing all that stuff and everyone's 
abs were just super strong. If you saw some of the stuff that these guys did and uh, whenever someone's squat kind of went in the pooper or something, they needed something. That's what we did. Let's just increase our, uh, the strength of our and thickness of our midsection and it works. Hmm. So, yeah. So transitioning more into the advanced level. Now things get juicy for yourself, uh, you know, working with advanced people from in the strength world. And obviously these guys are really big too. How do you progress at that level? Because obviously the result, the results come slowly. Yeah. It's the, the, that if you think intermediate sucks, wait till you get to advanced. <laughs> Uh, and I think what ends up what people need to understand is it's almost very similar to how I train my youngest son. We operate because the the more advanced you are, the less time you're ever going to be at that level. Mm. So for example, uh, if you're a thousand pound deadlifter, you're not able to deadlift a thousand pounds maybe once or twice a year if you're lucky. Mm. Okay. Now, if you're a 225 pound deadlifter, you can probably do that almost all the time. So I think what ends up with these guys end up doing is they, <clears throat> they train at such a lighter level and then just build up and then just come right back down. They, they cannot, you cannot maintain your peak very much. And we always say that the longer that you maintain your peak, the weaker you are, because, you know, uh, yeah. and it's going to take, uh, for some people, uh, it'll take two years to go up 10 pounds on some certain lifts. Now you might get some big jumps occasionally. So I think one is you have to train those people and they instinctively know this or they wouldn't be there. I think they train lighter than people think during the off season um, because they're not only is it healthier for your body, but you just, like I said, you can't maintain that. And I think they do a lot of just general prep work, like what I do with my son, right. And my ha athletes, we just do a lot of assistance exercises uh, to prepare yourself for that peak. Um, and I think with the, the older guys, I think a lot of this stuff ends up being bar speed related. So let's say we're squatting and we're doing uh, 725. They will cut that set off a lot of times before when it starts grinding because they know it, it's not it, that's not going to serve any purpose. And they're just going to either get hurt or uh, for the next workout, they're going to be just dead. So I think there's you have to really understand how all that stuff weighs on to not just the performance today, but for uh, the next workout or even the next week. Um, so it, it's crazy how those things, the beginner and the advanced kind of have this, some of the same things. The, the difference is the beginner is going to get much stronger, very obviously very quickly where the, uh, some of the older guys, uh, I know, uh, guys, it takes seven or eight years to put five pounds on their competition bench press. I mean, that's a long time. If you think about holding two, two and a half pound plates in the hand, like this took five years, you know? Um, so, and the other thing with, I think with the older guys is, uh, the, the volume on the barbell stuff has to be well regulated, uh, just because it takes so much out of you. I mean, it just really takes it out of you. Um, so, and then at that point, you know, being healthy is sometimes the most important thing is, uh, so they already have all that strength. It just depends on like, Hey, as long as I'm healthy, I'm fine. So what, what's the least I could do in this weight room to maintain or build strength and still be healthy for a meet day and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that's, it's such a balancing act, uh, with an advanced lifter. But the thing is, is in, there's no real one way of doing that because those guys got there and they understand the training process much more than I think people understand. And they instinctively, un, you know, can, can figure that stuff out. If they, you know, even I've seen, now there's always those freaks in nature. I saw a 19 year old kid deadlift 901 or 903 one time. Now he might be super strong, but he was an advanced lifter. Mm. Right, because he only been lifting for like four years, and mm. uh, he didn't really understand the process so much. Um, so when I say advanced lifter, sometimes it doesn't just mean how much weight you're lifting; it just means how much time you spent uh, training your craft, so to speak. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Oh, dude, nineteen years old, nine oh three deadlift. That's insane. <laughs> it's just like. I always like when I mentioned the kid that could do that ridiculous box jump and I watched him run, I always wonder what he thought of the rest of us, you know, just, 
or trying to, <laughs> he's like, just go more this way, just go this way more, <laughs> just jump higher. I don't see what the big deal is. <laughs> so that's why generally speaking, like the best coaches are the guys that had to struggle where mm. the guys that maybe were super talented generally don't make the best coaches because they didn't really have to struggle. They didn't have to really earn and figure stuff out. So that's mm -hmm. just, you know, that's normal though. Yeah. There's lots of talk about periodization, you know, amongst the, the kind of science-based community when programming for advanced people, what, you know, I know there are different ways of doing this, but what were some schools of thought that you liked in terms of say how to set things up over a long period of time, like say you're training over setting up your training calendar as an advanced athlete. Well, when you're advanced, you kind of have to know uh, how long your uh, workup period needs to be. For some, uh, it's when I say workup period, that means like when you're training with, you know, ninety percent weights and above and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you kind of have to know where that is because four weeks might be good six weeks but you know maybe seven weeks you're taking a huge dump your body just can't handle that mm. so i think what we did like at west side uh is i calculated this most of our work uh on the squat was around 77 percent. so we're always let's just say 80 percent in that mm. range um and i think we do a lot of really solid reps there and then anytime you work up as long as as long as that bar speed is good, you're fine. Hmm. Okay, uh, we don't want real insane grinder reps. So I would say, um, for the majority of advanced lifters with the periodization, you want to, <clears throat> and every lift's going to be a little different. Um, so you you might be able to train. Mostly we train the deadlift a little bit lighter um, because yes. you can. Like you want to always have the most the minimum effective dose to get stronger. You don't want to have to because you got. Uh, a lot of lifts to, to increase. So, um, but basically spend more time around probably 70 to 80% in that range and not doing any set to failure on the barbell lifts. Every rep has to be owned and perfect. Does that sound like something I've been saying a million times? Yeah. Um, and then letting that assistance build up. And then as you start hitting heavier weights, your assistance generally goes down a little bit. So uh, it's very much, I mean, if you look at Prilipin's chart, I mean, I don't know if, how people are familiar with, uh, Prilipin's chart, but he's a, uh, God, it's in, I don't know, maybe the, one of the Russian manuals, but he talks about the, the percentage of your one RM, uh, and how many, uh, reps per set to do and how many reps total you should do. So as an example, around 70 to 75%, I don't think you should do more. I think they, it's something like three to six total reps or mm -hmm. per set. Mm -hmm. So now 70%, I think what 70, it depends on your, uh, on who you are, but generally 70, 75% is where you're doing sets of 10, right? In that area where you're doing sets of three some of these times, sets of four. So mm -hmm. instead of doing one set of 10 at 70%, you might do uh, three sets of three or five doubles. Mm -hmm. Um, this is on the main barbell work. Yeah. So if you have a chance to look at what's called Prilipin's chart, it'll kind of give you an idea of uh, what I'm talking about. So none of those sets are really taken to failure. This is for advanced lifters. This yeah, is yeah. not. For, um, and uh, there's, a, you know, you have to find your optimal volume and he gives you a range. And I can't, you know, for example, if I think over 90%, 90% and above, uh, you're looking at do, usually doing one and two reps and i think it's a total of six to ten reps so as an example let's say i'm your bench pressing or something uh and your best bench press is uh i don't know 500 pounds and you're so when you're around that 450 mark give or take uh as long as you may only do uh four sets of one in that area so when you're done, I'm just giving the example. When you're done, you're never going to feel like, oh my God, look, I had a great workout. It's, I did the correct workout, not, you know, insane getting mm. jacked. And then you follow that up as an example with heavy dumbbell incline presses, where that's where you start getting the volume in, uh, you know, chin ups, dumbbell rows, all that upper body stuff that helps support the bench press. So that it's almost as if, those main lifts are treated like Olympic lifts where you look at, because remember Olympic lifts are all fast. 
that's yeah. kind of how you want to do that stuff. That does now again, this is not for everyone, but this is how I saw it and what I was ex, what I experienced. So, uh, but I think the idea that you got a great workout if you're training primarily for strength and just power, we're not looking to have a great workout. We're looking for that workout to do what it's intended to do. Does that make so? We're training, we're not just doing a workout. Yeah, that's why we're always been. trying to build. Uh, and we do what is necessary today to get to the next day or, you know, to get to the, the final, uh, training with purpose. There we go. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that the quality of the workout, isn't just how crappy you no. feel at the end of it. I'll tell you this right now. Uh, my goal is never, not never. I always say 90, about 90, 95% of our workouts are just solid kick-ass workouts. The kids working hard. And then every once in a while, we toe the line of stupidity and sometimes fall over. And that's fine. But we don't do that very often. Mm -hmm. We do not do that very often. And I think that's important even uh, with my own training. Now, I'm much older and I don't train like that anymore. But it's, it's about what it is. I usually do uh, maybe one or two dumb things a month where you're just <laughs> like, God, this is fucking stupid. But every other day, I'm just having good, solid workouts. I'm making sure everything feels good. And then occasionally it's like, well, let's see if I can do, uh, you know, what did I do? Like, shit, 3,200, uh, climb 3,200 steps in the, in our stadium with a 20 pound vest mm. and, uh, dude, my legs are just doing this yeah, and, you know, and, uh, but I can't do that every day, but what's awesome is even if my, as an example, to get ready for that. I don't know if I did more than uh, 2,000 stairs hmm. during, a, during a workout prior to this. So I just logged a tons of really good workouts. It's not like I did, as an example, this is what I call the Iron Mind. You're probably too young to know what Iron Mind is. It used to be a great magazine. Uh, and uh, for all the different strength sports, it was big on grip strength, Olympic lifting. And, uh, they all, they're like, listen, all you gotta do is add a rep every day or, you know, add five pounds. Well, that does, that's not how fucking training works. You can't just add a rep and add five pounds. That's mm -hmm. just ridiculous. So <clears throat> like, for example, let's say you wanted to, uh, run a marathon. So the first day, according to them, you run one mile the first day, the next day you run two miles. <laughs> oh, yeah, take you 26 days. You'll be fine. <laughs> they do this less than a month, you know? I mean, fucking, I'll do it in February. It's easy. And so what we do is we find kind of the the volume that you can handle that still you work hard, but you're not going to die. And we just pump the shit out of that. Just beat the shit out of that. And then when you do that, by the time you do your stupid stare challenge or whatever it is, uh, you are not, you're healthy, you're fresh, and you've built up all these days of just kick-ass punch, punch in the clock days, you know? Mm -hmm. So. But yeah, I never want my kids to feel like uh, they're beat to shit. Because if we do that on a Monday, then when we come on Wednesday, those kids are exhausted. Now we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're not just their bodies, but they're they're fit. They're mentally just don't want to be there sometimes. So I'd rather keep them a little hungry. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah, planning uh, ahead. Yeah. For someone who's, say, intermediate to advanced, and they want to build both strength and hypertrophy, how would you program them across the year in terms of periodization? Like, would you uh, have well, phases? Tough. Yeah. Um, and I would probably, I wouldn't do like a 12 month phase. You kind of fit, you have to know how long you need to stay in each phase. And if you don't know, you just need to experiment. As an example, uh let's say we do six weeks of general prep mm. okay so we're uh whatever that means let's just pretend uh we're a fairly advanced lifter and uh so we're operating mostly in the 70 to maybe low 80s mm. uh and then we're really building our base okay so that might be six weeks and then we'll do maybe three to four weeks we start to ramp up the weights uh on so we're still doing like singles and doubles and stuff like that mm. but uh now the interesting thing is for an advanced lifter is how much of assistance work can you do that won't take away from that and that's where it, really where it becomes a balancing act um the other thing like if you're primarily a power lifter what we do is in that prep phase 
we're still doing our normal, uh, you know, lower, um, how do I put this lower? <clears throat> so if we're like, for example, we're doing 70%, we're not doing sets of 10, we're doing sets of three, four and five, just smoking. Mm -hmm. But we will also, this is what I, what we did is we would still work up and do a single, but the single was never a max. Okay. We were working on doing the setup perfectly, mentally getting ready, taking that bar off and just screaming. So that, that max, so let's say you're a, uh, your best bench press is 500, generally speaking, during this prep phase, okay, you're maybe a capable of like a 470 bench, right? Because you're not holding that max through, throughout. Mm -hmm. So we might do a few singles at like 430 or 420, whatever, as long as that bar speed is good. So we're mm -hmm. always practicing that, that skill of a 1RM, all right? Mm -hmm. And then, so when we transition into uh, to our peak phase, so to speak, we've already got that skill. We've kept that skill without burning ourselves out. The yeah. problem that always people have is when they do that, they instinctively think, if I'm doing a single, that makes me I'm doing a max. And no, we're practicing that skill of getting under the bar and learning how to push with extreme force and just handling maybe a little bit heavier weight and it should never make you feel burnt out. So, mm -hmm. um, but man, that is, that is one of the hardest balancing acts. And I can say this for myself and almost every guy I trained with, <clears throat> except for one guy, that almost everyone screws up the peak because they get terrified that they're not ready. You know, they overdo. It's like cramming for a test. Most <laughs> of the guy, I've known every single guy that I've known that entered a meet, maybe without realizing, like maybe two weeks they signed up for a meet and they just kind of just doing good work. You now just not putting the pedal to the metal. Almost always PRs, are PRs at that meet because they're not overtrained. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that in the in the world of lifting uh, guys who are love lifting they generally do too much and then they mm -hmm. freak out when the meat comes around or whenever comes around just like i'm sure you've seen you diet yourself out of muscle yeah. right you freak out and i've it happens all the time it helps it happens in sports uh with practices they practice too much before a big game you know thinking they need it and uh then the game comes and it's like, why is everyone exhausted? Well, because we, we fucking practiced our asses off three days, you know, four hour practices. No wonder why the kids' knees are killing them right now. So um, it's funny though, how that works out. So I think in that world, and I'm sure you've seen like, you, like you probably messed up your diet, right? Like calories were a little bit too low or something. You freaked out. I got to bring out whatever. If you didn't do it, everyone else has, right? And I, I think that, <clears throat> with training i think people generally do too much and one of the big things is i came up with the five uh for coaching i'd have i don't know where i put it but one of the five coaching truths hmm. this is just for me and my the kids i work with the uh <clears throat> i don't know what number it is doesn't matter but it's quality always trumps quantity hmm. and one of the things that we really push this off season every off season, I have like a different focus because I really, because I'm always trying to improve. And I told the kids, listen, I, we're going to do less exercises, but I really want you to focus on kicking ass on those exercises and doing the best you can on what we're doing today, because we're only doing three things. So you better kick ass at that thing that we're doing because there's not, you don't get to make it up by doing a million sets of something else. Mm -hmm. So uh, I always think and I, I made, I remember about 20 years ago, I said this, you know, quality always, what was it? Oh, perform. No, this was different. Performance trumps uh, looks every time. Uh, <laughs> that's the last girl you slept with. Uh, but I, I think quality matters so much. I really do. And uh, I just, so whatever, I can go on and on about that. But anyway, that's something that we really, so I'd rather have guys do, I always say, like, if, let's say you're training at lunchtime. Let's say your lunch is just an hour or something. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to fit all this crap in. And now you've just had a shitty workout where I said, listen, Bill, we're going to do bench presses and chin-ups. So now you don't, you're not freaking out about trying to do a million sets and, you know, rushing through things. We're going to do this right. And we're going to do this right. And we're going to kick ass at these two things. So instead of trying to fit seven exercises into an hour where you're rushing around, we're just going to concentrate on kicking ass and doing this. And now, not only did you have a great workout, uh, but you actually did something right. Mm -hmm. 
you know? So uh, I'm a quality over quantity every time. And I know like there's the volume queens, I call them. Like you gotta, like, you gotta do a million sets of this. I'm like, well, why don't you do less sets, but do them awesome? How about we just do things awesome? Mm. And uh, anyway, so yeah, I thought that was quality really over. interesting what you were saying about the, you know, the singles and how a single isn't a true max Not where max. everyone feels like if they're, if we're gonna do a single, it's gotta be like balls to the wall, super heavy. Yeah. You know, yeah, but that you can still build that specificity for the strength yes. and having that maintained in your program, yeah. as you said, even kind of more in the the farther out, more off season yeah. type periods. Especially, yeah, if you're a power lifter, you need to practice your skill, but you can't practice your skill so much that it's it's beating the shit out of you. Then you're not doing anything. And then what ends up being is, I always t I say this a million times for those guys: training is not testing. Stop testing, train do things that, that need to be done perfectly. So there you go. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And then in terms of, you know, that off season period, what would the training look like for that athlete? For example, you said kind of, you might hit one single that's a little bit lighter and then do some, do some more, uh, volume in the sort of 70, the 80, were, percent. Well, again, this is going to be kind of individualized, but, uh, so let's just say like, this is just for me. I'll just, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. I should probably turn this off. Huh? No worries. I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, so what I did was I always made sure whatever, I did one main lift a day. And I've always made sure that I had a plan for that, you know, whatever that would be. <clears throat> and the assistants just use this uh, for the bench press that my, I did two hard, assistance exercises after that one a full range pressing motion so that could be dumbbell bench dumbbell incline overhead press dips push-ups and one big lat movement chin-ups rows that's it there's just chin -ups, mm -hmm. just chin-ups and rows and then after that what I, I do what's called bulletproof work and that's all the little stuff that uh the rear raises for your upper back uh, mm -hmm. tricep push downs, barbell curls and stuff like that. So you, your tier system is, this is the, you know, the main lift, this is really done fast, strong, and awesome. And then we kind of bodybuild what a typical bodybuilder workout, two more exercises, mm -hmm. full range, just building muscle. And then everything else is two to three extra, two to three, uh, sets of maybe three exercises where you're just getting that stupid pump and making sure you're feeling good. And I always tr obviously you always track the main lifts and then you track the uh two assistance lifts that you mm -hmm. do and you know you try to improve on those things and there's different ways of doing that you just kind of have fun and a lot of times based on how you feel like you might say like you have a let's just say everything's feeling crappy Instead of doing uh, those big assistance exercises, you just might do the bulletproof work and go home. So you have to be willing to adjust your program. And as I tell this to people all the time, coaches, look, we have a plan every day when we go in there. It rarely goes to plan. Mm -hmm. Something's going to come up. The kids are not feeling good. Uh, we, whatever, there's a million reasons why. And so we have to learn how to adjust. And you need, on your daily training needs to adjust greatly. So it's great to have a plan. It's awesome to write it up on paper, share it on a forum and stuff. But the bottom line is every day you have to be willing and understand how to change things. And I call it, no, you have to know where your trap doors are. Like that you're getting chased through a house, you know, <laughs> uh, by a serial killer. You have to know where all the little entries and exit points and all that stuff is so you can get your hell out of there. Because again, if you're not feeling very good and everything's kind of going to shit, if you do the workout as you had planned, a lot of times it's just going to screw you up for the rest of the day. Yeah, so that's really intelligent. I think yeah. that it highlights that fact that I've been noticing, you know, as I become more advanced that you can't progress all exercises at the same rate, you know, it's where it's no, like, as no. you said, the, my big movements are the priorities or what I'll call maybe my index yeah. movement. And that's what I really am looking to progress. And maybe a few of my assistances, but you can't, you know, be progressing every exercise no. at a maximal rate. I had a kid one time ask me, do you know what a face pull is? Mm -hmm. uh, he's like, well, uh, how do I increase my face pull poundage? I'm like, first of all, I have no idea why you care. Like you just grab that rope and just do this until your body can't move anymore. 
He's like, well, I want to make my bench go up. And Louis says the face pull is important for your upper back. I'm like, well, he's telling you to do the movement, but like, <clears throat> if you're a 150 pound dude and you put 300 pounds in the stack, you're just going to fall forward. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's not practical. And who cares how much you, you face pull, you know, that's one of the things when we do our bulletproof work, I still want the kids to push themselves. Uh, but I'm like, no one gives a shit what you lateral raise, you yeah. know, just do it correctly, you know, do it under control. You're going to be fine. It's not like, uh, you know, I did a 50 pound lateral raise. That means my bench is going to skyrocket. So no, there's no, there's no carryover to that stuff. Trust me. So, but what's one of the things that we have, a, like, as an example, when I work with the kids, we have a general plan. And then within that plan, I write down a specific thing. Hmm. Okay. So as an example, let's say we are doing, uh, our, I want to have the kids do heavy overhead press as an assistance exercise. You go in there, the kids are just dragging ass. You know what? We're going to do three sets of push-ups to failure. And that's going to be our big pressing motion because I, you guys just aren't ready. We still need to kind of exhaust those muscles a little bit. All right. So now we just alter the plan a little bit to coincide with what the realities of the training day are. Hmm. So we do it all the time, man. It's just the way it goes. So, and as a, the hard thing is you need to kind of get over your, it's almost like a uh, Puritan work ethic. Like I need to punish myself, you know, yeah. I to, and there's times you need to do that. Right. But there's other times, especially the more advanced you get, man, you have to listen. Like when everyone, someone's like elbows hurting, like it's their body way of saying, listen, dude, uh, you got to change something. Right. And then you're like, ah, fuck that elbow. And then all of a sudden it blows out. It's like, dude, I told you, I told you for two months. <laughs> You won't listen to me. And uh, I'm, you know, I'll admit I'm just as guilty as anyone of pushing through that. And sometimes you have to push through a little bit, but your body is, has an awesome way of telling you what to do. You know, sometimes you have to punch it in the mouth, but other times, especially when you get older, man, uh, I heard a great saying one time that said, when you're younger, what was it? <clears throat> you really want to train hard and hopefully stay healthy. And when you get older, you just want to stay, stay healthy and hopefully get to train hard occasionally. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but that's, you know, that's the way it should be. I don't, you know, uh, I was uh, at home in my parents' house for Easter and my uncle's like, oh, how you doing? I'm like, ah, you know, like everything, just something hurts and this and that. He's like, uh, really, was it worth it? I'm like, of course it was. Like, I don't want to, I'm so happy I got, and I re the only things I regret is not pushing harder. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's why the young people, like they're the ones pushing the records. Those are the ones pushing the boundaries. Us old guys, like we just like I'm just super happy when I touch my toes. And <laughs> I'm joking, <laughs> but uh, but that's that's when you're supposed to do all that awesome stuff, you know. When you're younger, that's those are the guys going knocking down doors in Fallujah. Who gives a fuck? Like the old guys, they can't even lift my leg. <laughs> can't knock down a door. <laughs> so that's the way I kind of see it, and it's it's awesome, man. I urge, and maybe this is the wrong message to send, but I urge every young kid, man, go. Just go push that pedal down, man. See what you're capable of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that I'm not telling people to get hurt, but I, like I said, the only things I regret is not doing the stupider stuff, just really pushing my pushing harder than I thought. I really don't. That's, um, so anyway, again, that's, you know, I, you're a doctor. I'm sure you don't want people to, you don't want, well, for you, getting hurt is fucking awesome. <laughs> you say oh, yeah. this. Oh yeah. I love I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm all for, I'm all for pushing yourself when you're younger. Right. Like I think that it's that that's the time. Right. And I'm obviously there's intelligent ways of doing it, but um, yes, this like the hard work and discipline always are there. Yeah. And you know, it's uh, you know, those, the, there's not a lot of 60 year old guys doing uh, squirrel suit flying, you know, because they, they're too they're too smart or they're if they, they no one ever uh does squirrel suiting for very long because they usually die <laughs> but like that's that's where they it's a young man's game you know you're not going snowboarding off of a 50 foot cliff you know when you're when you're 48 years old that's for the 20 year old pothead <laughs> stay tuned for our next episode on squirrel suit flying <laughs> that's great so yeah anyways i think that's been packed with a lot of valuable information there's lots more to yeah. talk about, but obviously, but we'll have to get to that to another episode because I've got to get to the hospital. Nope. Okay. Work. Uh, where can people find you? 
we have uh, social media, obviously, on Instagram. Uh, I answer a ton of DMs on there. So if you have a question, go ahead. I don't post a lot, uh, but I always try to answer all the questions I get. Uh, and then we are on our website is jimwendler.com. Uh, we have a ton of stuff. We're obviously on Amazon. That's, uh, you know, we ship everywhere. Uh, and we also have a private forum that costs, my, my wife just yelled, Tell them, we have a private forum that's $5 a month. Uh, I'm on it several times a day. We have probably the greatest group of dudes who have helped each other. Um, there's no political shit on that forum. Uh, everyone has to post with their real name unless they are involved with like a police operator or military operator, stuff like that. We have a lot of old guys that have been on the forum for 10 years uh, and a lot of people come on and they're mostly just dudes, like middle-aged dudes. Some are older, some are younger that just need help. And it's probably the, this is when I first started this and it's probably been 13 years now or so, maybe a little less. This is what I envisioned. I wanted a kick-ass group of people uh, that we can all share stuff without any calling you with, you know, you piece of shit, you, you know, the usual forum crap. So you, we, you know, everyone has to sign up with their name. They, uh, and we, we've only had a boot off, I think two or three people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so like there's a level of decorum on there. There's obviously it's fun. You know, you can, you, it's not like just a bunch of stodgy guys getting, uh, but there's a lot of dudes with a lot of experience. We have some tier one operators on there. Uh, we have a lot of coaches on there. We have just a lot of guys just like me, just wants to get stronger and stuff like that. So, um, and if you're anyone's interested in how I train our kids, I keep an updated everyday training log of what we do with the kids set for set, you know, basically, and uh, answer any questions. So if you have interest in training kids, if you have interest in training yourself, stuff like that, this is the place to be. It's a giant, I love it. It's so cool. Like, remember, are you too young to remember? Forums used to be kind of cool back in the day, and then it just turned into a shit show. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I like that. It's really important to have that community when you're starting yes. out. And especially nowadays yeah. when we have the internet, it's it's a beautiful thing that you're able to connect with these people all around the world. Yeah, it's, it's you know, in the... I don't know. I, I'm just so happy that there's like a genuine place instead of I'm not you know, posting all over the internet about, you know, how manly I am or whatever, uh, you know, just kind of like ridiculous stuff that I see all the time. It just doesn't interest me at all. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'd show so, my abs if I had any. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put those links in the description and thanks Thank again you, for being bro. on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. I appreciate it.